Okay, so we have David Lee, formerly of Icon and IOC, but still very much active and influential in the profession. Over to you, David. Right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, penalty of being here at this stage in the day is that not everything I was going to say has been said, but I ought to rewrite everything I was going to say. Uh, so you'll have to forgive me if this is a slight clash with what might have gone before or if I uh, cover some ground that's already been covered. Um, but I can't, I'm not too good at improvising on the spot at this time of the, of the day. However, um, after today's uh, talks, they're thoughtful and stimulating and uh, in certain cases very provoking and provocative and talks and excellent discussions. We may all be feeling, I think, a little bit queasy now about uh, formal codes of ethics. I, you know, one hesitates to even mention the phrase now. We know that they include important principles, some at least of which we feel collectively ought to be upheld, but there are some aspects of them which give us cause for worry, especially now in the light of, as we've heard, changing attitudes both to heritage and to contemporary and conceptual art and so on. And the question is, so should we ditch conservation ethics altogether? Is that what's being said? Should we consider ways of refining them? Well, I think they do have a purpose, and I think you do too, really. Uh, for an answer, and one of the things we might do is consider whether we ourselves consider ourselves professionals and whether we are members of a profession. Let's look at what components might help us agree that I think we are professionals. And here are some of the, the things that make us up in, to be professionals. And amongst these is membership of a professional body, which probably most people in this room are, uh, and involved in that is, is some kind of disciplinary process. Now, you might agree that dis disciplinary process is essential if we are to be able to exclude or chastise conservatives who are doing what the majority of us believe to be the wrong things, and that we should have some yardstick by which we agree to admit them to our professional club in the first place. Bear in mind that we are not a regulated profession. Just about anybody can legally call themselves a conservator, and some anybodies still do. Yet we have agreed collectively that we do need some kind of differentiation. We are, in effect, using membership of the professional body to help us distinguish a professional from a non-professional. If you don't like professional was a word, think of conservator, conservator restorer, or practitioner, if you prefer. Um, there, are, there are various levels of membership, of course, and one of these is uh, the professional accreditation of conservators, uh, which is, in a sense, in one sense, a higher level of entry and also of potential exit. Uh, ICON is one of the professional bodies who operates the PACR scheme. Well, whichever level we want to go for, um, all conservational professional bodies, and not just ICON, and indeed not just conservation bodies either, operate a disciplinary process. Uh, uh, and, and, and if you enter it, whatever it is, you, you're expected to toe the line. Furthermore, if we're collectively to promote ourselves to the public and to institutions who wish to pay for conservation services, as we surely have done by establishing the Conservation Register, then we also need a set of criteria against which to include and possibly exclude membership of that register. And as you know, there are now six bodies which support the register, three of them operating PACR, which we've already seen, the others... you. You may, I hope you recognise, well, you can work out the acronyms. The others running their own form of accreditation. The criteria of the Conservation Register um, include things like you must carry appropriate insurance, you must keep good records, you must comply with health and safety, and so on. But most significantly, you must be an accredited member of one of the Register's six professional bodies. If for any reason you were, able, were to lose your accreditation, by one of those bodies, you would almost certainly lose your membership of the register. If we were to look at ICON's disciplinary code, as I have recently been asked to do, we'd find that one of the key components of that disciplinary process is a code of ethics. This is one pivotal aspect. The other part of the disciplinary code or process is all about the processing of a complaint that may lead to a disciplinary procedure and that includes boring things like setting up disciplinary committees, listing possible sanctions, the appeals process, and so on and so forth. The ethical code used in this context is the set of rules against which someone accused of misbehaving will be judged. Did they or did they not contravene or infringe some art item or article of the code? Now, as it happens, the ethical code which ICON uses is, as we've heard, the ECHO code. This is a problem. Um, 
So th those are the two components of, of, of ICON's disciplinary code. This is a reminder of who ECHO is, in a very summary way. Um, we don't belong to ECHO, so we're using a code that isn't really ours and we didn't invent, and we didn't actually terribly much approve of it in the first place. But it also include, is difficult because the code's not all that we would now like it to be. And as the days go by and meetings like this go by, it gets ever more out of date and out, uh, inappropriate. For instance, it's got legal, the legal advice we've had is that some of the articles in it are so vague as to be not measurable in a clear way, <laughs> such as could be used to apply a sanction against a member. Another problem is that some of the articles in the code are not entirely appropriate. And here's a little bit about the, the shape of the ECHO guidelines, um, uh, which takes us into the codes of ethics. And then there are useful things like Failure to observe unprofessional practice, unprofessional practice, we haven't mentioned that, will bring the profession into disrepute. Uh, national professional body has to take action. Um, and there are some easily judged tests, like do they, is good documentation in, included? Do you collaborate with other professionals? Do you help out in an emergency? And so on. But there are other less easily judged things, um, which, uh, which are, just don't fit and we find very hard to work with. And others are referred to other articles which apply vaguely but not tightly enough and not usefully enough and not actionably enough. Um, uh, and another problem is that it isn't, strictly speaking, all about ethics. Is, eth is it ethical or just good practice to maintain good documentation? We've raised that already today. Is it just good business practice to keep the client informed? So maybe we should get ourselves off the hook to some extent if, as has been suggested today, we go for something called, say, a code of conduct. Your code of conduct could include ethical uh, components, but it needn't be all about ethics. And it would perhaps make this ethics thing a little, a little bit more pain, painful. Was that a, a one minute? Thank you. Um, well, I've only got one minute to go. We could, we, um, we could use the PACR standards. Um, so we changed the... We could use the PACR standards, but they don't contain suitable standards of conduct, which we could use as a legally defensible measure, as it seems. And there are, there are difficulties with those as well. Um, there's some, they're, they're, they're primarily designed for assessment for accrediting people. They're not designed for this sort of purpose. And uh, I've got a few examples there of how they're not appropriate. Um, although there are some useful things about it. So where does that leave us? Um, if a conservator does something which we all and most of us agree is wrong, say, you know, they smash a client's pot and they stick it together in the hope of fooling the client, to take a silly and extreme example, or if they contravene or are widely agreed standards of conduct in more subtle ways, we do need robust tools. We need to protect the public and clients, we need to protect their heritage, and we also need to protect the rest of us, not to mention protecting the conservator from herself or himself. Does she or he need to be warned, to be given a chance to improve, perhaps by undergoing further training? Should he or she be excluded from membership? As things stand at present, our disciplinary code, as I've said, needs tightening up. It's not, it doesn't work well enough and we do not have a sufficiently robust code of conduct or ethics. Both these tasks, which might be carried out in parallel with our, might be carried out in parallel with our rejoining ECHO, at least we should consider that, will be getting the attention of ICON in the coming months. If you are interested, ladies and gentlemen, in helping, <laughs> please make yourself known to, uh, for instance, Jane Henderson, and, uh, or to myself, or anyone else who would like to volunteer to be made known to. Anyway, Jane or myself, um, because your assistance and your interest in this would be very much appreciated. Can I just add that no, no code is going to be perfect. I'm going on what we've been saying today. No, no code is going to be perfect or will answer all situations. Ultimately, decision-making depends on a team, a team of well-qualified, experienced, wise individuals like yourselves and like all your colleagues working together to arrive at decisions of what's to be done. So it's not just a very narrow conservative ethical code. It's much wider than that. So thank you very much. Thank you, David, for rounding the day off so succinctly. Jane, would you like to respond? I can undermine that by being less succinct. Um, David, don't go do, away. Do, 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 do. <laughs> do you think that this is 
a question of levels. Um, people have been saying to me as well in the discussion that perhaps we need some kind of higher, slightly a, a value set of values that describe ethics and our understanding of ethics, which is quite an aspirational and not perhaps a legal document, and then a separate code of practice which describes the things that conservatives do, which you know we revise and fiddle around with as we realise that something didn't work. Or do you think that perhaps the way to resolve ethical disputes is to put it to panels of wise people, that you know, we can recognise what's wrong when we see it, um, even if we can't describe very specifically how, what correct is in legal terms? Well, it's interesting, the idea of putting it to panels of wise people. If you mean on each and every occasion mm. when an ethical problem arises... How often do ethical problems arise in uh, ICON? Well... In ICON, if you're talking about individuals and cases and complaints, not many. So but, we could uh, convene the odd panel. You know, we can't reinvent an ethical code and item every time something comes up, I feel. I, I'm not sure that's a practical answer. I mean, by all means, you have a, a, body, a body of wise people who will use a document that may be fairly broad and perhaps written in broad terms, general statements, and then you use that as a basis document to, to focus on a particular case. Yeah. That sounds all right. Okay, thank you very much. Has anybody got any initial comments, responses uh, they wish to make in regard of David's presentation or before we move forward to the final session? Uh, Yota Manti, Cardiff University. Well, I'm thinking here, you, you're seeing the code of practice or code of ethics as a disciplinary for, for disciplinary reasons, but previously we heard other people talking about educating the public or educating other non-conservatives. So perhaps we should be thinking also, what is the purpose of the ethical codes in the first place? What is the use? Why do we need this one? You know, and then try to twist, it, you know, to to apply for that. You know. I totally agree. I mean, I was, I came at this from a particular direction, largely because I was asked to look at disciplinary codes. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. We need The code serves many other purposes, whatever, whatever, whatever we call it. Uh, the suggestion has been made that we use it to promote who we are to the outside world. But I think that's a somewhat different objective. And I, my feeling is you need a different kind of document to explain <coughs> what we're about to the public, to clients and so on. I think uh, our own code, ethical code, would be as it, as it is at the moment, I don't know if you would change it, is, is rather uh, narrowly professional, and we recognise the terminology, and we know what these terms mean. OK, it's not irreversibility, but you know, it's the, the technical thing. And uh, I, I, I think, in principle, I agree with you, but I think the solution that was suggested earlier on of using the ethical code to explain ourselves, personally, I would find that a bit tricky, trying to make it do too many things at once. Okay, thank you. Uh, I find talk of a disciplinary code quite alarming. What or how would you deal with the situation where a conservator has been told by the director or whoever, you will do that? I don't care about your ethics. This is what you're going to do, or you lose your job. Do we then well, we haven't invented the idea of a disciplinary code. I mean, ICON's had one for quite a few years, um, and most professional bodies do. So I suppose the situation applies wherever you work. Uh, your relationship with your employer is, is a completely different thing, it's in, in a way. If you wish to use your professional ethical code as an argument to your employer then it's open you to, to you to do that. If you wish to go further and say, look, if I do what you tell me, I'm going to get thrown out of my body and you will no longer have an accredited conservator on your staff, you know, you could probably use that to, to advantage. It might actually be, be quite helpful to have that. You know, this is, you know, this is business relationships, human resource management and all that. So it's another, another area, really. I think we as professionals, just like medics and lawyers and so on, do have to have our own our own rule book, as it were. Okay, Jack, one on the front, and then we'll move on. I think. Uh, 
Jack Kirby from Think Tank again. Um, perhaps one for Rachel to comment on, but we had a quite interesting presentation at the Midlands Federation of Museums from Nick Merriman, um, who is he chair of the MA Ethics Committee? Uh, certainly from Indeed. the MA Ethics Committee um, recently. And the, the interesting thing about what he was saying was that the, the MA Code of Ethics actually has very little sanction. The only thing they can do is throw people out of the MA. But it tends to get picked up on in newspapers and things. And so I suppose I'm really making the point that irrespective of how effective your disciplinary sanctions are, they can have more impact, more bark than their bite in a way, and that can ultimately be very useful. And the fear of what the MA might do to you, while that might actually not be very significant in the grand scheme of things, still puts organisations off behaving unethically Absolutely, and yes. individuals. Mm. Yes, it could be used. I, I suppose you're thinking of accredited museums losing their accredited status, for instance. Well, the interesting or thing is the MA code MA. doesn't necessarily lead to it. I mean, there, was, there have been differences of opinion on some things between ACE or MLA and uh, the MA. So the two are not inherently conjoined. But nevertheless, people's fear of possibly losing something like accreditation is linked to how they're perceived by the MA code of ethics. Yep. Mm. OK. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, what I'd like to do is move to the to closing session. So thank you very much, David. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the panel.